Greetings, saints. I greet you in the name of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. We can start our worship this evening with the singing of hymn 101. Hymn 101, Great and Marvelous Are Thy Works. And we'll sing this hymn standing. Greetings, saints. I hope you enjoyed the uh, spring shower that we had. Certainly, uh, we need the moisture, and so it is a blessing. I would like to ask and announce that uh, if you have a little trouble navigating stairs or just getting around, please wait for the golf carts to take you to your cart, or please wait for someone to escort you to your car. We don't want anybody to fall or have an accident. So they'll be out there and waiting to help you uh, if you need that help. As a call to worship, I would like to read from section 162, starting at verse 5. Remember, remember, my remnant saints, you are the chosen few to bring to pass my kingdom in these last days. To whom much is given, much is required. Throughout the revelatory direction given to the remnant church from the prophetic office is that which is required for bringing to pass my Zion, and therefore my coming. Read, study, and obey. I have up on the rostrum with me this evening, uh, on this side, starting here, I have High Priest Austin Purvis, and he's going to be giving us our invocation. I have uh, Josh Turner, who will be uh, Priest Josh Turner. He'll be giving us our ironic moment. I have 
High Priest Tom Motes, who will be giving us our benediction. And I have our presiding patriarch, uh, presiding, I almost made you a patriarch, um, presiding, <laughs> pres presiding bishop, uh, Kevin Romer, who will be giving us the offertory. And then um, we have our president and our prophet, uh, who will be giving us the spoken word. So if you would turn in your hymnals with me to hymn 333, hymn number 333, again, we will stand singing this hymn. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come here this night uh, with high expectations, uh, expect expectations to be blessed by the power of your Spirit. And our hope is the kingdom this night, to see it in its fulfillment uh, in its fullest. And we pray that uh, you would bless us this night uh, through our prophet, president, seer, and revelator, President Larson. May uh, he show unto us what needs to be, that we might have your kingdom here amongst us. May he bless us this night is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. theme for our ironic moment this evening is led by revelation. And as Jim read off the call to worship, I was reminded of a quote from Winston Churchill, that if you have a point to make, don't be subtle about it. Use a pile driver and then come back and hit it again, a tremendous whack. We have a few scriptures, including the one Brother Von Cannon has already read, on this theme of lead by revelation. First comes from the 16th chapter of Matthew, the 18th and 19th verses, which I think will be well familiar to all of you. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, being the rock of revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord has granted us prophecy 
both in days past and in today. And this is prophecy that has not changed. From the 13th chapter of Hebrews, the 5th to the 8th verses, Let your consecrations be without covetousness, and be content with giving such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And to this bounty, this gift of revelation that has been given to us, has been the charge to read, study, and obey this prophetic direction. For by the things which are written, we will be judged. From the 162nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the fifth verse, Remember, remember, my remnant saints, you are of the chosen few to bring to pass my kingdom in these last days. To whom much is regiven, much is required. Throughout the revelatory direction given to the remnant church from the prophetic office is that which is required to bring to pass my Zion and therefore my coming. Read, study, and obey. time for the bishop's favorite part of the service. <clears throat> I'd like to read from the book of Malachi and the great promise uh, that lies therein. Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Will the deacons please wait on the uh, waiting congregation? it's the bishop's favorite part of the service because I believe it's an opportunity for God to look down from his throne from the realm of heaven and watch each one of us as we give back some of those blessings that he gives, has given to us and the angels the rejoice part of the service? and sing hallelujah 
as we respond to the love and the gift that he's given to us of his son, Jesus Christ. Shall you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings of life. We thank you for each one that is here tonight and that has uh, come out in such inclement weather, even at uh, the risk of bodily harm. Father, we would pray for those uh, that weren't able to uh, make it here tonight that uh, they might receive a blessing as well. And Father, we uh, would ask that uh, as we move forward in this conference that uh, your will might be done and that uh, we might do those things that are pleasing unto thee. And I ask this in the sacred name of thy son, Jesus Christ, whom this day we remember his resurrection that gives us the great hope of returning unto thee in a resurrected form. And we ask this in Jesus Christ, most holy name. Amen. Might do those things that are pleasing unto thee. And I ask this in the sacred name of thy son, Jesus Christ, whom this day we remember his resurrection. It gives us the great hope of returning unto thee in a resurrected form. And we ask this in Jesus Christ. My scripture this evening comes from section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It was given in 1940. The prophet then, Frederick Madison Smith. He had been president of the church for 25 years. My scripture. And he had six more years to go before his death. It was a period in the history of this country that had passed through depression, and contention in the church, and was approaching a world war. And this is a counsel that he gave to the church at that time, which will be my topic for tonight. History of this country that had passed through section 138, and paragraph three. <clears throat> Church. Let the church again be admonished that the task of establishing Zion presses heavily upon us. Barriers and hindrances to the achievement of this goal should be removed as speedily as possible and practicable. To lay securely the foundations for Zion and her buildings, that's interesting. The work should be accomplished in peace and harmony. Unity should prevail. To this end, all the saints should work together in the rich fraternity which can and will prevail among them when they keep faithfully the commandments. Great blessings are in store for the church if it will in faith and saintly devotion go forward in its tasks.
it is yet day and the night will soon come i await the coming forth of my zion my word must go forth in greater power by those who have Thank you, Sister Gusman, Sister Verdun. That was beautiful. It is my privilege and my honor to introduce to you our prophet and our president, seer and revelator, and I'd like to add brother and friend, Frederick Niels Larson. I wanted to say a few words, and I, I told him I wanted to introduce him. I've now served under the prophet for about six years now. And in that time, I've had something that you all haven't had a chance to have. I've enjoyed spending many hours talking to him about the doctrine, the truth of the gospel. And it has meant so much to me. And so my heart is full, and I hope that in this short time that we have, that if you receive the joy that I have in spending time with him and the ministry that he has given me, well, you'll know how I feel. Brother Larson. Well, thanks for those kind words, Brother Jim. I just want to say how appreciative on the fact that Sister Gusman just brought up an air of peace, quietness, and uplifting with us in that moment that she sang like a canary. Thank you, Sister Gusman, as always. And you know, this is the first part, I guess, of the conference, you know, and it's it was it's kind of different this year because of the timing of the April 1st, Resurrection Day, the beginning of the conference, and we determined to, to have a full week, even though in the past we, to some extent, had a full week with our educational series on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But I thought it was an opportunity uh, for us to extend the time, because I'm always hearing sometimes that we don't have enough preaching. Um, but we will. Um, we'll be having prayer services in the morning as usual. You've seen your schedule. And following that, there are various things, and particularly tomorrow morning, we'll open the conference business session in the afternoon. And, you know, after uh, 16 years of presiding over the church, I've come to recognize, even though sometimes maybe my eyesight fails a little bit, I can recognize I know where people are sitting. 
They always sit in the same place. There's Dr. Burdett over there. There's Brother Kilpack right back there on that aisle. And I can just about tell everybody, and there's Brother Goodrich, and he and his family always sit over there. The one that's missing this time, I think, though I, I really do miss, is, uh, is the uh, uh, folks from southern Indiana. Uh, Bishop Richard Paris and his family will not be here, apparently. And uh, I also recognize something else this evening, because the moment we sang the first hymn, I could hear that voice coming out. It happened right here in this front row, right there on that aisle with a fellow in a blue shirt. Apostle Roger Tracy. I could hear his voice up here. Glad you're here. And so we have so many wonderful things to look forward to. And this year, with regard to the preaching, there is a pattern that we're going through. If, if you hadn't noticed it in the schedule, beginning, I think, with, uh, I think it's uh, appropriate with the president's address. And if I recall, we had that privilege in the RLDS church, if I remember, that usually on the first day the president addressed the church. But with regard to the idea of, of a people that are, that are based on communication with the deity, then that has to do with the concept of revelation. And with regard to the preaching series, if you'll notice, I think there's logic in it, as we have the leading councils of the church bringing the message tonight, led by Revelation, tomorrow night in the world, but not a part of it, so fundamental to our belief. Bishop Romer is going to bring that message. And then the idea that we'll be one in Christ. And that message comes plain and clear from those in the missionary arm of the church. One in Christ, and the president of the Council of Twelve, Brother Don Burnett, is going to bring that message for us, focusing on he who is it after all, is the head of this church, not me, but the Lord Jesus. And then on Wednesday, I think another component part of our basic belief that's so important has to do with, with the Word of God. And I have suggested to President Von Cannon to bring us some thoughts with regarding Lehi's vision. Behold the rod of iron, the word of God. And you know where it leads to, the tree of life. And then I thought also that the challenge might be for us to answer the question, what must I do? And I phrased in that also, what must we do? And I've challenged 70 William Baker to bring those thoughts to us about what must we do personally and what must we do as a church to a certain extent as best he can. And then on Friday, the idea that having all that basics with regard to us, let us go on to perfection, which ultimately is the goal for us. And I've asked our presiding patriarch, Carl Van Cannon, to bring that message. And there are a couple of features this year with regard to the conference. And that has to do with two very real successes in the Remnant Church. And one of those has to do with the uh, community building called Bountiful. And there are going to be some tours for you folks that are interested in seeing how that community is at the present day compared to what it was when we began several years ago. And the other accomplishment has to do with the Visitor Center, in which we were challenged a few years ago to present the face of the church to the community and to an outreach. And through the efforts of President Van Cannon and Sister Nordeen and Apostle Patience, that has come to pass. And there is a 15-minute film that describes who we are as a church in the visitor center in the headquarters building. And those will be featured also with the tour. 
And then we have the classes on the three classes that are going to be presented with regard to the, our program with One Endeavor, which has President Von Cannon tomorrow morning bringing us the idea of the fulfillment, fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the gospel. And I'll present on Wednesday what is the kingdom, and then on Friday, the vision to the kingdom. We've been exposed to that in the past few months to a certain extent, but we're going to present that material again. And it primarily came out of the very first revelation that came to this church and what it <clears throat> challenged us with to present the fullness of the gospel and the kingdom. And I guess I challenged myself as to what is meant by the fullness of the gospel, to have that better explained and un understanding and that's happened. And try to define the kingdom. That was my challenge. And so we will hear about that on Wednesday. And then Bishop Romer to bring us the vision to the kingdom, which is the journey to that end. But led by revelation is a theme for the conference, and we've got it up on the banner. Hopefully you can see that and understand that and why it's there. Because there's something very fundamental in our belief, very basic for us in our belief, and that has to do with the concept of revelation. And even though it's been read once tonight, I've got it in my notes, and I'm going to read it again, just so you understand it clearly. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, Son of Man? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered, And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and he said, Blessed art thou, Simon of Arjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And that word reveal is so, so important for us to try to understand. The basis of revelation. Sometimes one can define revelation, and it's relatively easy, especially if you look in the dictionary, which helps us understand. It's the disclosure of something not previously known. It's a communication by a divine agency, prophets. And that's in the dictionary. It's to make known by divine means. And that's what revelation is. It's a way the deity unfolds to the human, the human intellect, the human mind, his design, his plan. That's what it is. And you know, Amos, one of the minor prophets, made this statement. He says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants and the prophets. And so I guess that we have become a part of that secrets from the deity, from divine, from Lord God that guides and directs us. Now, sometimes people will ask, well, what's the difference between revelation and inspiration? Well, this is the inspired version, right? This one is, yeah. And that inspiration came from a Latter-day Prophet that as he was reading the words in the King James Version, he was given to understand the true meaning 
of certain things that are in that book. And he recorded them. And we have them in the inspired version. And so the word of inspiration can be defined like this. It's a prompting of something to be written or said. It's a divine influence upon human beings. Now, I suspect that every one of you here in my voice have had a moment of inspiration. Usually we call that the gift of the Holy Ghost, that abiding spirit, that abiding comforter that comes to us. But it's a divine influence upon your mind and your heart and your intellect to bring understanding, and that's inspiration. And that's something that's shared by all, or can be. Usually, it's dependent upon the quality of our lives and the situation we put ourselves in to receive that inspiration from the divine. That's so important to us, so important to us. The idea that we stick with the disclosure of something not previously known, a communication by a divine agency, even prophets. We are led, and that's a key word we're focusing on, by those who have been given authority to make known things by divine means, even the prophets. For our understanding, even though we have the understanding in the scriptures of the words of the prophets in the Old Testament, and even much of the prophetic utterances that come to us that are in the New Testament, the idea that the prime event for us that call ourselves restorationists because the gospel of Jesus Christ after the dark period and a falling away was restored by a young man who later claimed to be a prophet, Joseph Smith Jr. was a prophet. And the revelation that came to him, we probably don't know the exact reason why the Lord picked him at that time, but it happened in the time and the period that it was. Joseph Smith, Jr., and those that followed, his son, Joseph Smith III, his oldest son, Frederick Madison Smith, his full brother, Israel A. Smith, and his half-brother, W. Wallace Smith. Those men followed a pattern and a vision to the kingdom, as it were. Sometimes I can't help but recall and trace my involvement in the work of the church. But I, I think it's interesting to, to tell you. When I was eight years old, my father, who was a missionary from Denmark, came to the church, baptized me in the font in the stone church when I was eight years old. That was 1940. And the president of the church, Frederick Madison Smith, confirmed the gift of the Holy Ghost upon me at that time. And then later on in my life, it was President and Prophet of the Church, Israel A. Smith, that ordained me to the office of priest. And then it was later on that W. Wallace Smith, early in his presidential ministry, ordained me to the office of elder. And so I guess there's some posterity that resides within this body, and I'm proud of it. King Solomon 
in writing his Proverbs, uttered these words. You're familiar with them. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And so it is that an organization of people who claim to be religious, the people who claim to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and to obey those principles that are brought forth thereof, must be an organization that looks forward. They're led to a final goal. And that goal is for Jesus. For Jesus, it was the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom on earth. And for us, it is Zion. And so, In section 102, in paragraph 9, because there is a connection, and it needs to be understood, with regards to the idea of the kingdom of heaven and kingdom on earth, for which Jesus was responsible for in bringing to pass. In section 102, in paragraph 9, but firstly, let my army become very great, and let it be sanctified before me, that it may become fair as the sun, clear as the moon, and that her banners may be terrible unto all nations, that the kingdom of this world, Joseph the prophet understood this, that the kingdoms of this world may be constrained to acknowledge that the kingdom of Zion is in the very deed the kingdom of our God and his Christ, and therefore let us become subject unto her laws. Let me briefly return to section 138. Let the church again be admonished that the task of establishing Zion presses heavily upon us. Ever since a group of men and women, brothers and sisters, determined that what was happening in the mother church was off course. And ever since, many of those people came out from that organization, they always understood the concept of Zion. It was a goal, it was a hope in many of your hearts, I'm sure, of how to accomplish that. The task of establishing Zion presses heavily upon us. And it pressed heavily upon us and we decided we needed to do something about it, except just talking. I think we intended to follow the words of James in his epistle, when he said, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. And so we understood that the task in bringing Zion to pass was heavily upon us and that indeed barriers and hindrances to the achievement should be removed as speedily as possible. That was a tough one, because there were a lot of barriers for us, a lot of heartaches, a lot of broken families, and they're still broken, and that's a shame. God be that someday that those around us will recognize where the true church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints exist. For here we have the full priesthood organization, and we are about of establishing the concept of Zion. 
to lay securely the foundations for Zion. And there's curiosity, in, and he inserted in the word to the church and her buildings to lay secure the foundation for Zion and her buildings. Now, the prophet, President Frederick Madison Smith, envisioned a literal kingdom, a literal society living out those principles of the gospel. And that's why he inserted that. He saw structures and buildings and communities and her buildings. The work should be accomplished in peace and harmony. Well, we worked pretty hard in that direction. And there's been some challenges for us. But brothers and sisters, we have overcome. We have overcome. Because I say to you, I truly believe that peace and harmony exists within the body of this church, the body of Christ. Unity should prevail. I say it, it is prevailing. And if it isn't, those edges and fringes that are going to be brought into that unity. Because as the Lord had directed through the prophetic office, in unity we will find strength to do that which we were called to do. And he went on, President Smith said, to this end all the saints should work together in rich fraternity, which can and will prevail among them when they keep faithful to the commandments. And I believe truly that this people are people who are obeying the commandments that have been laid down for us. Great blessings are in store for the church if it will in faith and saintly vision devotion go forward in its tasks. His task when he presented that 40 years ago do you know how long ago that was? That's 60 years and 18. That makes what, 78? As I said, I was eight years old. I suspect the majority of you weren't even born when he brought this direction to the church. That seems like an awful long time ago, doesn't it? But the time is ripe. And the time is near. The end is close. His vision of the church is the vision for the remnant church, building the kingdom, even Zion. And the vision, of course, needs to be understand that it's a growing process. It's a growing process. We are not a people just treading water. I determined when I took the prophetic office that we were not going to be just another restoration group. We had set a goal and we had vision with regard to implementing those ideas of Zion and a community and to fulfill that which had to be done for the Lord Jesus to come back to it. We're not standing still, but we're always growing. And who knows what he will direct his secrets through his servants and the prophets. There are many recent accomplishments, and I just want to mention four as we get toward the end of my message that are all given in revelation to the remnant church. Not just four, there are others. But I, I made a list that I started out with, but that would be too long and too boring, I guess, to review all the things that are in here. There's a lot of things in here, direction for us. But at least four. Let me just mention those. Happen to be has one of them has to be bountiful to community. That vision that was seen in the Kirtland Temple when the priesthood met and challenged this church to community, and it wasn't without some resistance. But you know the success, hand in hand with the Lord, and particularly the bishop of this church and the men of the bishopric 
it unfolded that concept of bringing community that we were told to build. And secondly, it has to do with the direction to the church to engage more fully in public relations so that we're not just isolated here. This community does not know much about the Remnant Church, unfortunately. And I say, let's change that. And so we have the Visitor Center, which is a beginning, as people will come through there and see who we are and the message that we proclaim. And then another significant event that has just recently come to pass has to do with organizing the Center Place of Zion. For in 2005, that's how many years ago? 13? We were told, it's now time for the next step in further unifying my saints. There's a message for unifying these people, not scattering them which will be to designate the land known as Jackson County, Missouri as the center place of Zion. This geographical location will include, at that time, the three current congregations and allow for a more formal organization to occur, similar to a stake. Planning for this entity will take place during the next year with clearly defined guidelines set forth and reviewed by the Standing High Council with submission to the next general conference. Well, folks, that didn't happen. And we've just realized recently that when we began to formulate the center place of Zion idea, which basically says there is one congregation and four meeting places. Because if we continue down the road with individual congregations, they'll eventually want to become autonomous I'd suspect that wouldn't happen, but it's a possibility. And that's what's happened to all the restoration groups. They become units unto themselves, not wanting to associate. And our hand is, re is reaching out to every one of those folks to come and hear. But anyway, we realized that we hadn't reviewed that concept recently with the Standing High Council. And that we did. I believe we did it. Yeah, we did. Okay. <laughs> Too many meetings. We did review it with the Standing High Council and said, this is what we're pre presenting. And with submission to the next general conference. And so anyway, that's going to happen. And lastly, with the Aaronic priesthood emphasis, with the designation of Brother Romer, as being a literal descendant of the tribe of Levi. That took courage on the part of this prophet to declare, but it was revealed once again, led by revelation, this body of people, you folks, were led by revelation, that concept. And it is true, it is true by witnesses from others. And with that designation, because apparently the Lord knew it all along, that he was leading his people in the temporal aspects of the gospel to the fulfillment and the recognition, recognition of the concept of consecration for this people. Because now we fully understand that we're challenged with our time, with our talents, and praise be to God, we're full of that. And I'm looking at Sister Barbara Shear and Jerry. I can recall back at an Iowa reunion, I don't know how many years it was, Barb and Jerry, that the Lord directed them to prepare to bring their talents to this land of Zion. And they prepared themselves. And here they are sharing their talents and their ministry with this people. And many of you here present tonight 
have done that. And so with the emphasis on the temporal aspects of the ministry, particularly the home ministry, which is so important, so important. Even as the prophet Frederick Madison Smith admonished the people some 80 years ago, let us be admonished this day by your president and prophet to the same task. And my note says read again 138, but I'm not going to do that. You have understood it, I think, what I had said. One might ask, I suppose, the president of the church might bring some direction for the next few years or the decade, perhaps, if I last that long. But for all of us, there is a day of reckoning when we pass through the veil. But I can't say much about the future except what has been given in terms of the chaos in the world, the economic situation. And what I see is civil unrest. We now live and I don't like it. I think it's the wrong direction. We live in an armed camp. And all we hear about in the headlines are shootings and killings every day. Shootings and killings. And the issue of the Second Amendment with the right to bear arms and all that sort of thing. But I was concerned when the first Security was brought to the schools when you couldn't even go into school and visit a teacher or your grandchild without certain passwords and codes and security doors and all sorts of things. That's not the way to live. And the Lord hasn't called us for that. The idea of nuclear arms. I'm as fully aware as any one of you having been involved in the development of nuclear arms, that one of those things is not pleasant. Not pleasant at all. And so that wears upon us in our thinking. And I was, I was going to talk about the future a little more. And you know what I was going to do? I was going to hold up a cell phone and a debit card and said, here is the future. Believe it or not, that's where the future is. Can we stay out of debt? Can we prepare financially? Can we not be abused by the social media that occurs on that cell phone? And all the controlling factors that exist in that little box. You heard about it, you hear about it in the news. It's going to be there. We've got to face that. Either we withdraw ourselves completely, which we can't do. We have still got to be in the world, but not a part of it. Yes, we are built upon a secure foundation, even Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone. And as long as we remain faithful, and as long as we understand what the fullness of the gospel is, as it applies to us, and as long as we understand something about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom on earth, and as long as we have a vision and a road map to the final goal, we shall achieve. We shall be united as one in Christ, knowing that there is strength in his word. Behold the rod of iron. There is the foundation. Challenged by the question, what must I do? What must we do tomorrow, next month, next year? Agreeing together that we must go on to perfection. 
always brothers and sisters. Always showing how deep our faith is by showing our holy works, even works of righteousness. And as long as we do that, continue to probe how strong is our faith. Can we withstand the buffetings of the adversary in the days ahead? And let us be challenged and let us put on the whole armor of God and we will resist and we will be successful and we will finalize that kingdom. And at some point, whether some of us may not be here, some of the younger might, when the time comes that we have achieved the degree of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ will come and he will visit us and he will teach us and he will show us genuine love and care for each other and he will teach us how to learn and teach others and so it be, may it be. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May it be so. Amen. We could turn on our hymnals to hymn number 288, hymn number 288. We limit not the truth of God, and then following the benediction, we'll have hymn 285, so put your finger in that place, and we're just going to sing hymn, uh, verses 1 and 4 on hymn 285.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Holy, holy, holy are there thy purposes and thy ways. Lord, we have been blessed today, for we know the scriptures say that when we gather here at this place, that thy spirit will be here also. And we have been blessed this morning from the very, be for the, from the very beginning service as we reached for that bread, we have felt your spirit. When we reached for the wine, we felt it again. And we've been ministered to during that service, O oh Lord. And then, Lord, in our the resurrection service, we again felt thy spirit. For we give thanks unto you, O Lord, for thy son, Jesus, who left his heavenly abode and will willingly came here and took upon this body. And he died for each one of us that we might live. And it is our testimony that he lives, that he that we might have life. Yea, Lord, abundant life. And we came this evening, Lord, and we have heard our friend, our brother, our prophet speak unto us. And we have felt thy spirit in the words that he has brought. We have heard wisdom and we've heard knowledge. And we have felt that peace that harmony and the unity that is desired for all of us to have. May we go forth from this place, O Lord, united in purpose as one. Let us leave this place tonight, Lord, working toward and preparing and building that kingdom on earth, yea, even Zion, that then we would pronounce this holy benediction upon this service in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I have about a few announcements, about eight probably. 
nine to be exact. Uh, in the morning, we have a dear sister that is in Research Medical Center downtown. Sister Jonna Patterson from Center Branch is gonna have surgery. So we need to remember her in our prayers. Now, sister uh, Barbara, you correct me if I'm